I always mentioned this story many years ago. There was a person who would come to Yad Avram on when we were at 63rd Street between 5th and Madison. The person went to Harvard and the person was a Malchuba. And he says to me, there are times where I can't sleep at night because this question bothers me tremendously. I said, what is it? He says, I always question, do I have a soul or my intellectual animal? If I have a soul, I understand I have to live with the conformance of the Torah. But if an intellectual animal and I don't have a soul, so then whatever I feel is right is right and what's wrong is wrong. So how do I know whether I have a soul, that I have the spiritual component to me or not? Phenomenal question. Yes, this question to 99.9% of people. They'll say, I feel it, I diss it. I give you some LSD. You walk off, off the roof like you think you're walking, you know, on a 20 lane highway. What you think or what you feel means nothing. Beyond any doubt, factually speaking, how do you know you have a soul? That's where it begins when it, where it ends. Only one answer. Well, we were at Sinai and we openly prophesied and God communicated us. The Torah's entirety, the Ten Commandments, he revealed to us that what are we were a composite of physical and spiritual. The core essence of every human being is a soul, a spiritual component. The Jew soul is a different dimension than the Gentile soul, what we call the Noahide. This was factually established, and we were formed and taught this at Sinai. The creator tells us that's the reality of human being. Now we understand now, we put things in context, why we are permitted to do certain things or obligated to do certain things, or the many lines we can't even cross. Because it's detrimental to our spirituality, which is the essence of the person. That's what I answered him. And that is the right, that is the correct answer. Let's say you don't have that. You don't have that answer. The Ramchal says there are indicators that the human being is more than an earthy entity which has drives. It's something which supersedes that and transcends that. How do you see it? Firstly, it's obvious that the human being is the height is top of the ladder of creation. Because a human being has an intellect and there's no species in existence that has the intellect of human being. Why was the human being endowed with that intellect? That intellect automatically reveals that there's something different about this being than every other being. Every other being is earthy. So you have different levels of earthiness. But the human being who has intellect and could advance the intellect and knows all these intellectual capacities and he has choice and he can dictate his life, evidently he's more than this earthy clump of earth <clears throat> which every other unintelligible creature was created from. That's firstly. So automatically that indicator tells you there's a component in the human being which doesn't exist in with any other living species. Without Sinai, there are certain hinters. We have hints. There's certain people, they merit divine clarity. They have an understanding. I'll give you an example. Pharaoh the monarch, the king of Egypt, was a pagan. When Moshe originally came to him and he performed the miracles and he says, who are you? He says, Hashem elokei Yisrael shalachanin aleichem. God, the omnipotent, God of Israel sent me to you. So what does he do? Takes out his encyclopedia of deities and you know what he says to Moshe? He's not listed. I never heard of such a God. Okay? This Pharaoh. That that you're proving miracles, it's all sorcery. I'm not impressed. That's what Pharaoh tells, tells 
Moshe, not impressed. Okay, Moshe walks out. As they say in English, either learn the easy way, you learn the hard way. You're going to be obstinate. We're going to break every bone in your body. On top of that, it's going to be worse than that. We're going to reduce the height of civilization to rubble. The people will experience levels of limitation and suffering not to be imagined at a level that they can't control. These, these are the templates of Egypt. Okay, that was the Egyptians. And they were smart people, very advanced as a civilization, but they turned it down. But yet, when Paro had the dreams, which he couldn't have one of his own dream interpreters, all the wise men weren't able to give any reading on that. All of a sudden, this Jew who's rotting in the dungeon for the past 12 years, they pull him out. Because the wine steward had said, I had a dream and he interpreted and the interpretation was exact and accurate. Maybe he could help you out. He comes out and he's cleaned up. He's groomed. He comes before the king and he says to Paro, I heard you have the special ability to interpret dreams. Yosef says to Paro, it's not me. Elokim Yanishlom Paro. God will bring peace to Paro. It's not me. It's God. Then he gives a deciphering, which is exactly, and Paro says, that's the answer. Seven years of, of plenty, seven years of famine, and Yosef gives a solution immediately. How you have to appoint one person to oversee it, to store it away, and so on and so forth. And then that will save the country from destruction during the years of famine. Because people believe when things are good, they're good forever. But that's not reality of life. You have very deep canyons. Very deep. And you don't know even if you can get out of it. That's life. So if we have to store the grain and so on and so forth, have distribution centers throughout the country. What does Paro say? Paro's a pagan. And Yosef says, didn't I tell you that God will bring peace to Pharaoh? That this dream is in the best interest of the future of your civilization. Paro says to his wise men and to his courtiers, have you ever seen a person with the spirit of God within him? Yeah, this is a pagan speaking. It was a level of genius. He said, this is not human genius. This is divine genius. Have you ever seen a person, Ruach Elokimbo, the spirit of God is in him? What are we talking about? So we see. Man's a pagan. He doesn't believe in God. But he couldn't deny that that level of understanding of how to deal with the issue, besides the deciphering of the dream, this clearly speaks volumes that this person is not an intellectual animal. He transcends the animal. He's more than that earthy being. He's a being who's a spiritual being. And therefore, we have to follow his advice. And they did. And Yosef saved Egypt from hunger, starvation, and they would have deteriorated and gone into the oblivion. So we see, even if we don't have the tradition of Sinai, that God revealed to us and explained to us every aspect of our being and existence, but there are moments when we say certain things and we see it or we hear it, it's undeniably that's the divine. Otherwise, it couldn't happen. So that's what the Ramchal says. Although the world is earthy, dark, unrefined versus spirituality, but the glimpses within that, that if you are focused sufficiently and you do a correct analysis, the takeaways could be a human being is more than this earthy physical being, much more than that. That's the Ramchal. I saw yesterday, there's a commentary, I mentioned him, Kli Yoker, on the Chumash, and he writes, originally at the time of creation, God says, the earth will give forth its herbs. Its herbs. And then he said, regarding trees, he says, the fruit trees, the trees will produce 
the fruit trees will produce fruit. So it seems to be superfluous. If they can produce fruit, evidently the fruit trees. What does it mean? And the fruit, the fruit trees will produce fruit. That initially, what was the fruit trees meant to be? Not only was the fruit edible, even the bark should have been edible. The angel who oversaw the tree coming into being did not follow instructions. Now, when we speak about grass, grass is for the animal. Produce is for human, for human consumption. But ordinary ASAB, ASAB, which is grass, is for the animal. Every type of sustenance that exists in, in, in existence, it's paired and corresponds to the physical maintenance of that species. For instance, there's certain animals who are not, or carnivorous. There are others that they only eat vegetation. They don't eat meat. The ones who eat meat don't eat, don't eat vegetation. The human being doesn't, cannot process, cannot digest grass, has to be more refined. So when the Torah says, I, I'm creating ace of, ace of grass, herbs, that's for the animal of the land. Primary, that is, the, it's made up of an earthiness that reflects the, the earthiness of the person. Fruit, the fruits of the tree are much more sophisticated, more refined. That's for human consumption, the fruits of the tree. Because when God says, and the fruit of the tree will be for man's consumption, and when Adam is in the Garden of Eden, he says, all the fruits of the, of the God are permitted to you, except for the fruit of the tree of knowledge. We only speak about eating the fruits, the fruits of the tree. We don't speak about the herbs, the grass. We don't speak about that. So what happened? So he explains, initially, grass is paired to the animal. Grass is earth, earthy, the animal's are earthy. The human being who has this very special spiritual component called the soul, he has a higher, more advanced level of sustenance. He's a human being. It's, to, it's paired with his soul. It's a being that's soul physical to enhance and advance his spiritual soul. Not that it should sink into the earthiness of his physical being. And therefore it speaks about the grass is for for the animals of the field and the fruit of the tree is for mankind. So what happened? If the tree would have been edible not only on the fruit level but even on the bark level that means the tree would have had no relevance to animal consumption. You have the leaf you have branches, you have other part of the tree which are not really edible. The animal could eat that. So that means that which was meant to be for, for the human being, which was paired to him, now the human being is ingesting certain parts of that fruit which have been lowered, which has that characteristic of an animal. So when we eat those foods, we eat the fruit of the tree, of, of the tree even though it's paired to a degree with our soul, because we're a physical, spiritual being, but simultaneously, it's very heavily weighted that it's, it's animal fodder. So we're ingesting food which is meant for the animal, and that takes us down. That somehow stunts and, and obstructs our spiritual development for that reason. So I was thinking, we find that when Moshe went to heaven to receive the Torah, he said, for 40 days and 40 nights, I did not eat bread and I, I did not drink water. Why is that important for us to know? So I mentioned the measure. The measure says that God says that if you want to be the receptacle and the repository for Torah, you have to wean yourself from physicality, from the bread and from the, from the physical, from food, to be more spiritual. Because the more you wean yourself from that, you're more spiritual as a result of that, you have a greater capacity to process spirituality, which is the Torah itself. But if you're physical, you have a greater physical component that creates obstruction and lack of clarity. And what's available is available on a limited level. So due to the tree not performing as it was meant to perform, 
it, there was a certain earthy component which was introduced, and now we ingest it. What does that do to us? It takes us down. It undermines our ultimate potential, which we could have achieved through eating the, the, the fruit of the tree, which was meant for human consumption. This human consumption now is at a level which is partially animal consumption. Because it's not fully edible. This is what the Kliyokar points out. Because Torah says clearly, the grass is for the animal. The fruit is for mankind. But the fruit for mankind now is not what it was meant to be. Because the angel that oversaw that and took the order, didn't carry out the order as God wanted it to be carried out. So Ramchal says that in, in life, in the world, there are certain things where the earthiness is blatantly clear. From there, you can't extrapolate or extract that there's spirituality in this world. But when you look at the human being and he has intellect and he has creativity and he has ability to, to navigate his own life and he's not bound and locked in through his... DNA, he's not controlled by instinctive behavior, but rather you can always override the system that clearly tells you he's more than just an animal. There's a degree of godliness in him that he has control over his life. Because just as the God dictates and controls, the human being himself has control over his own being. This is Ramchal. We know that certain species, they can only exist in their own habitat. Because the type of food, the climate has to be geared and accommodating to provide for that particular species. Other species couldn't, couldn't survive in that. Of course, the, the, the sustenance is available in that habitat doesn't meet the needs of that other type, type of animal. I once mentioned the name of the morale of Prague. There's a question which is asked by Nachmardis that Avram Avinu was thrown into the kiln, came out of the kiln. Never in the history of the world did anybody go into the kiln come out. He experienced one of a kind of a miracle. Okay? God says to Avram, at the age of 99, although you have no children and you're barren, you will have a child. The future of the Jewish people and his children will be like the stars of the heaven. And so on and so forth. Okay? And the Torah says, and Avram believed. When God told him that he believed. And that that he believed, that although he couldn't father a child, his wife was barren, that the miracle will take place, he believed. God considered this righteousness. It's impressive, he believed. So Nachbarati asks, a person who never experienced or witnessed a, lot, a miracle in his life. Avram was the per person who was the beneficiary of a miracle. Going into fight, coming out alive is a greater accomplishment than a person who's barren or his wife's barren, then now they're able to conceive. If you come out of fire alive, now God says you're going to have a child. That did you believe? Why should that be considered righteousness? That shows he's devout. Once you've been through it and you've been a beneficiary of that, it's no big deal to believe. I'll give you an example. I'll give you lemon meringue pie. That's one of the things uh, uh, that's part of the, you know that healthy diet. You know, egg whites and whatever else it is, lemon meringue. And you eat it. Ronnie eats it since he's a kid. Larry, and I say to you, you know, lemon meringue pie tastes like what I taste it. It tastes like this and this and this. And Larry and Ron says, you know, it's right, it does. Oh, you guys must be, you got really faith in me. Even when I tell you what it tastes like, you know what it tastes like. What do you talk? You taste it yourselves. I'm only confirming what you, you people experience yourselves. That that you agree with me, does that 
it maybe it says something about me, about, about yourselves, you tasted it. So it conforms with what you experienced. So why is it so special? They said, you know, it's right, it is that. Avram was in the kiln, came out of the kiln. That means God can, can perform any type of miracle. Now he says, you can have a child, although until now you can't. Avram says, I believe 100%, without a question. If you say so, yes. That that he believed, that confirms his righteousness. Rambane and Ahmad, yes. He was already in the fire, out of the fire. What's the big deal to believe? Why is that such a special level that you believe? That's the question of the Ramban, Nachman, please. Everybody gets the question. Ron, you get the question. So the morale of Prague says something phenomenal. Avram was an expert astrologer, stargazer. He could read the stars at the most advanced level. When he said to God, he says, how could I have a child? The stars say, if you read the stars, it says, Avram Elo Ben. Avram is not meant to have a son. So God says, it doesn't make a difference. But Avram will have a son. He believed. But the stars say differently. So the morale explains, on the terrestrial level, we have continuously change. The world's in flux. Person's born. He advances in life, adolescence, adulthood, and then at a certain point, life starts waning, and the person dies. You plant, it grows, it ripens, it deteriorates, eventually turns to dust. Seasons, one season to the other. Everything in life on the trash level is transitional. It's transitional. So what's the what's a miracle? Miracle is this change on the terrestrial level in either case. Miracle is a greater change. So that that you have a miracle on the terrestrial level is not really, it's impressive, but not the ultimate level of impressiveness. Why? Because this change, so God makes a change to a greater degree. On the celestial level, the heavenly bodies, there's no change ever. The moon is the moon, the sun is the sun, and the stars are the stars. So if the on the celestial level, it says, Avram is not going to have a son. You know something? That that I came out of the fire, the kiln on the terrestrial level, doesn't mean to say on the celestial level, you could change that. Because the stars say, Avram is not going to have a son. And on the celestial level, there is no change. Not a, a nuance of change. Despite that, when God says, you will have a son, regardless of what the stars say, that that he believed was considered devout righteousness for that reason. That's the morale of Prague. You got it? So even within existence, there was a certain person, he was a partner at Pay, Iron Pay, a student of mine. He's a South African and his wife's a South African. And he was a professor of architecture in South Africa. He moved to the States. He was listed as the top under 40 top architects in the world. Eventually, he joined Iron Pace Firm, which was a top architectural firm in the world. And he himself had two, 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 two sons. And if you observe family purity, you can't cohabit with your wife certain times when she's a menstruant, she's off limits. And there's no way to do it. And her gynecologist said to her that the only way you can have a child is you can't keep diet, you can't keep laws of family purity because it's, you could, will only conceive at a certain date which your wife's not permitted to you. That's what he said to her, okay? And they said, but maybe, 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 he says, you know, when hair grows on my palm, as the doctor said to, to this couple, when hair grows on my palm, that's when you're going to have a child. If you don't, if you follow laws of family purity, no way. It's not your cycle, and it's not the time for conception. No way, you will not. If you have a child, hair will grow on my palm. That's what the doctor says to them. So Rabbi Pinto, he should live and be well, was visiting New York. I take him. 
this couple to Rabbi Pinto, and I explained to Rabbi Pinto what the problem is. He said, don't worry. They'll have more children. It's going to happen. Don't worry. All of a sudden, a cycle was one type of cycle. All of a sudden, the cycle starts changing. A mental cycle changes. She goes to the doctor. The doctor's amazed. How did it happen? I got a blessing from the rabbi. A year later, she had a third child, a daughter. She had two sons. Two years later, she had a second daughter. Doctor, where's the hair on your palm? He said, when hair grows my palm, you're going to have a child. And because this is your cycle, it's not changing. All of a sudden, everything starts changing. Right? You become a believer. Within the realm of medicine, it's not, it's not on the books. It's not part of the statistic. This is a little bit of an eye-opener. You can say it's a fluke. Not many flukes like this. Maybe there's a power externally which is causing these things to happen. I'll give you an example. The Chavetz Chaim was known as, even among the Polish anti-Semites, as a devout holy person. Live in a little village, Robin, the streets weren't being paved. And during World War I, he had a student who had come from Germany who joined the yeshiva. And Robin was in Poland. And there were certain army installations around Robin, Polish installations, and they were always looking for spies, German spies. And all of a sudden, this young man shows up from Germany and rolls in the yeshiva. And they, the, gen, the government knew it. They wanted to frame the Chofetz Chaim. So they took drawings of the installations and they planted it in the bags of the student. And then one night they raid the yeshiva and they go straight to the bags of this German student. And sure enough, they find drawings of the installations, the Polish installations in this German, German student's bag. So who do they hold accountable? Evidently, the Chofetz Chaim is a partner in this espionage. So they arrest the Chofetz Chaim. They arrest them. They take the Chofetz Chaim to the court, and there's going to be a public trial. So you need character witnesses to speak on behalf of the Chofetz Chaim why this is an impossibility and it's a frame up. To prove it's a frame up. Of course, the Chofetz Chaim would never even consider doing such a terrible thing. So they had a character witness. One of the, and the prosecutor was a rabid anti-Semite. He wanted to literally to mutilate and to fry the Chavetz Chaim. Of course, he was this devout Jew. So they get a character witnesses. Witness come up and he's going to testify about the Chavetz Chaim's character. And he tells over a story. And this witness wasn't even a Jew. He was in the Vilna train station in Vilna which then was part of Lithuania, the Chavetz Chaim leaves the train, and as he leaves the train, somebody lifts his wallet. Somebody pickpockets him and pulls the wallet out of his pocket, and he begins running with the wallet, and Chavetz Chaim sees it. Rabbi Chaim immediately, hot pursuit after him. What does he say? you. I forgive you. Keep it. It's okay. Yeah. He's just victimized by this thief. And he's running after per se. You could keep it. I forgive you. So the, the defense attorney says to the judge, you see, he's one of a kind of integrity. There's no way he would ever do such a thing. So the defense attorney, so the prosecutor, who's a rabid anti-Semite, says to the judge, judge, do you really believe that story to be true? Do you really to be true? It's definitely not true. He says, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know if it's true or not true, but those kinds of things they don't say about me and you. That's it. That enough is an, a vindication of the Chavetz Chaim. That's the story. You understand? A person can be at this level. This is everything which is contrary to what a human being is all about. A human being is me, I, and again, me and I. And here this man is selfless that even though the other man violated, he's a criminal, that he shouldn't feel that he's a criminal, I forgive him. 
And therefore, he doesn't have to get complicated with me. Just let him go on with his life. What does that say? This is a chimpanzee. Is this a orangutan? Or is this a gorilla? Does this belong in the Bronx Zoo? Or the San Diego Zoo? Or the St. Louis Zoo? Does he belong? Where does he belong? This is an image of God. I told you the story about when Reb Chaimos, when uh, Reb Baruch Ber Leibowitz, who's known as the, there was a city in Lithuania called Kamenets, when he came in 1927 to raise money in, in the United States, he came with his son in law, and he was a very holy man, great Torah sage. And he was introduced to the mayor of New York. His name was Jimmy Walker, the mayor of New York. And Jimmy Walker sees this man. He can't take his eyes off of him. He never saw such a holy man. Okay? He decides this is the time at Tammany Hall. You know, when they got people used to wear spats and all kinds of this kind of thing. You know, bowler hats. People used to drive and check at cabs. You know, those days. Okay, joking. And he says, you know, Rabbi, I'm going to give make you the citizen of the city. We're going to set up bleachers in City Hall. And I want to honor you. And I'm going to make you the citizen of New York City. And I'm going to give you the key to the city. Okay. Said so he set up these bleachers down at City Hall, and the crowds are invited. And Rabbi Baruch Bear, Rabbi Leibowitz is sitting at the dais together with Jimmy Walker, and he stands up and he says, "You see this Rabbi? This Jimmy Walker was 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 a gangster, although he was the mayor in New York." He says, "You see this Rabbi? This Rabbi is a refutation on the Darwinian theory." Nobody could ever say that this man comes from the ape. It's clearly he's a he's a product of the divine. You know what this this guy this, this is Jimmy Walker speaking. This guy's in bootlegging and everything under the sun. He's Al Capone's first cousin. They're going to be buried next to one another in the same grave. I'm joking. I have no idea where he's buried. Okay, maybe he's with what's his name in the you know some landfill in New Jersey with, with Jimmy Hoffa. I don't know where he is. Okay. How could this criminal, this earthy gangster, he says, this man, clearly, he's a refutation of the Darwinian theory. There's no way he comes from the ape. He's there, there, definitely God's creation. The man was not Sinai. The man didn't read Jewish books. But knowing what's out there, seeing this man, he's not part of our society. He's another dimension of a human being. Clear, it's God. That's where it begins, that's where it ends. And that's what the Ramchal is saying. They're individuals in existence. Their behavior, what they know, or their level of intellect tells you this is more, more than an earthy being. There's a divine component that's associated with that individual.